Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. This is Jessica Crejo with your uh, Employment First Team and with the Iowa Coalition for Integration and Employment. We're so happy to have you here today for Job Development Strategies in Rural Areas with Tony Tweed, Rachel Riphagen, and Ken Kay from My Choice Employment up in Rock Valley area. We're excited to have them. Um, and before we get started, I'll take care of a couple housekeeping things. Uh, we are recording today's webinar. We'll be sure to send it out along with the presentation after the webinar to the mailing list. Um, if you would like uh, some continuing education credit for participating in today's webinar, happy to give it to you. Just send me your name uh, to let me know that you attended and I can verify that and I'll get you out a certificate. I think there might be um, a person or two on the line that I might owe for last month, so I will make sure that I get everybody their certificates of attendance. Um, I don't think there is anything else besides please share your questions, comments, reactions in the chat pod down there, and we'll be sure to answer those. I'll help uh, the ladies and Ken kind of field those questions, so please don't hesitate to share. Um, and I think without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Tony, Rachel, and Ken to get us started. All right. Thank you, Jessica. This is Tony, and I am the My Choice Employment Services Manager within Hope Haven. And I'm Rachel Ripagan. I am the area supervisor, so I kind of cover the management and supervisory activities for the western side of our service area. And I'm Ken Karzewski, and yes, Ken K. Um, <laughs> anyway, I am the employment specialist for the uh, Okoboji area and also cover Estrabo. Yeah, so today what we really want to do is just kind of give you a snapshot view of what it is that we do with My Choice Employment up here in Northwest Iowa and go over some of the specific strategies that we use in our rural areas. Um, one of the things that really, for this next slide, we see that the most dangerous phrase in the English language is we've always done it this way. And for us, that couldn't be more true. We've obviously gone over quite a big transformation process over the last few years um, and are continuing to do so. Um, so we are constantly inundated with change, whether that's our funding mechanisms or just the way that we have to practice different models that we have to use to best serve the individuals that we support. Um, and just making sure that we're meeting the needs of everybody that we have. One of the things that I kind of heard, probably it was two APSI, national APSI conferences ago, somebody said that perception becomes reality unless it's intervened upon. And for me, that was huge, kind of some of those old myths of, you know, there isn't anywhere else for somebody to work other than a workshop, or we can't do it here because we're too rural, or we, we don't have transportation, or there's just not enough businesses. And there was a, a a lot of naysaying, if you will, and if you really let that perception go without kind of interrupting it, it will become the reality. And so what we've done, obviously, is try to go the other direction. So within that, the times are changing. Just a little bit of a fun to get us started here in this afternoon. In 1998, don't get into strangers' cars, don't meet people on the internet. In 2018, you literally summon strangers from the internet to get in their car. So change is an okay thing. This was Tony and I had to introduce Iowa to the to the national AFC folks in Orlando. So we just thought it was kind of fun to share a little bit about some interesting facts about Iowa. So we won't go over all those. Most of you probably have have uh, heard of those at one time or another. But the one that really struck me I hadn't heard before was about Rob Lowe killing a goldfinch, our state bird, in mid-flight with a golf ball. That's pretty, yeah. Odds one in 747 million. So what are the chances? But Iowa 75% fouled, 100% awesome. I like that. Yeah, we tried to represent for everyone in Iowa. So we hope we did a good job there. So just to give you a little bit of history on Hope Haven, and we'll just go over this really quick because we really do want to get to the strategies that we use in job development. But we are CARP accredited. We have many other services outside of My Choice Employment. So we have community living services. We have mental health therapy and recovery services. Um, we have our religious services, we have um, behavioral health, there's a whole gamut of services that we offer. And maybe just a little update, we have closed a few of our workshops and are in, in the process of closing the remainder of our Iowa workshops here in 
the next foreseeable future. We don't have exact dates, but just a right. little update for that. Yep. So on this slide, you'll see the state of Iowa, and this just kind of gives you a glimpse of where we have a presence, and that top star is not a mistake. We actually are in Worthington, Minnesota. We have the Achievement Center up there um, where they work with IPS, and that's something else that we'll talk about here a little bit today, too, as we have just started that um, kind of a, pilot, a piloted project with two of our regions and then another region in the state to kind of get that going in the state of Iowa. And IPS is individual placement and support, and we'll kind of talk a little bit more about that model as well. When I try to tell people how rural we are, I always joke with them that, well, it's actually not really a joke, it's the truth, but I'm two hours away from the closest target. And for people that really resonates and gives them kind of an idea of how rural we really are. So here you're gonna see a timeline of kind of Hope Haven, the activities that we've done over the past few years um, and kind of the creation and evolution of My Choice Employment and where we're at to date. And obviously those arrows keep going because we have a lot of goals in our future. Um, as far as My Choice Employment becoming a standalone uh, within Hope Haven, that happened back in 2013. Um, since then, we've been we've had representation on the Iowa APSI board. Scott Whitty, our director, was there for a three year a three year term, and now I sit on the board as well. And that just really gives us um, a great opportunity to see how things are rolling out across the state and to kind of have an influence on some of the employment first philosophies that are being presented um, at the APSI conference and things like that. And just to put a plug in, obviously the APSI conference is just right around the corner, August 15th and 16th. It's a great time to get a lot of information from some really awesome subject matter experts. So I would highly recommend it to everyone. And a great time to get to know your colleagues in the state and problem solve and get yeah. new ideas. Talk to them about what's working, what hasn't worked. Um, brag and steal moments are some of the best takeaways that you can have. Not that the conference breakouts in their own won't be great, they will be, but really just sitting down with another job developer and talking about a job that they carved or customized, it's like, oh wow, I have somebody that could do that. And you kind of have those aha moments in some of those, maybe the social hours or the, the non-formal settings, if you will. Um, most recently, some of the additions that we had to My Choice Employment was we implemented transition specialists back in March. And so we have two transition specialists across our service area that focus primarily working with the schools. So before we had employment specialists that were tasked to get into the schools, and as you can imagine with their caseloads already being large, we probably weren't doing due diligence and making sure that the schools were getting the service provision that we wanted to provide. So now with our standalone transition specialists, they can really focus on a holistic approach to what transition means. And it's not necessarily just employment, but being a resource for all of the referrals that are gonna be necessary for a person to transition from youth to adulthood successfully. Um, also very in its infancy stages, we do, like I alluded to earlier, we have an IPS specialist. We have two that are working within each of our regions. Um, and they just started back in June and we're really just getting to the point where we're actually going to start kind of the case consultation point where they are going to start receiving referrals. The first month was a whole lot of training from a couple subject matter experts out of Minnesota, Claire Courtney um, and, and Carrie Yeba. <laughs> Two L's, I never know if it's an L or a Y. But, and we are kind of ready to hit the ground running with that and explore that opportunity as well in that model. This just real quick gives you a, a glimpse of how we do what we do within My Choice Employment. Obviously, our CEO drives everything downward, uh, supports My Choice and what we do. We have a director of partnership, which is Scott Woody. He oversees the entire My Choice program. Then myself, Rachel, the area supervisor, we have seven employment specialists now, two transition specialists, and two IPS specialists and then a whole slew of amazing job coaches from full-time to part-time to on-call. And it takes every single one of those individuals and then some <laughs> to, yes. to make it work. Um, real quick, just my choice employment, our intent statement is just, it aligns perfectly, we feel, with employment first principles, which in a nutshell, anybody that comes to us and says they wanna work, we're gonna work with them to get them a job in the community. So we want real jobs with real wages. All right, this is just a little info that we actually, we want to credit Ashley Lance <laughs> with. Um, 
just so going over a couple of different methods of job development. So got your traditional means of supported employment, kind of the sales approach, labor market statistics, um, trends, all that kind of thing. And then as Tony was talking about, we did just start the IPS, uh, Individual Placement and Support, that we've been doing up in Minnesota for about four years, which is, so they've been a great, a great asset and kind of helping train and get us going with that here too. Um, and that's also, you know, it's really geared at taking people this is as they are, you know, they come in saying, I want a job in this area, okay, and you hit the ground running. Um, but also some of the same kind of concepts with supported employment and customized employment as far as really developing that relationship with the employer and focusing on what they need and not just coming in there saying, we want something from you, we want to be a partner and, and have a win-win situation for both. And then, of course, customized employment, which we've had quite a bit of training on in the state of Iowa. So that's for our folks that might need a more, a very much more individualized job and really getting to know that individual well through discovery and then also really getting to know that employer well and what their their um, unmet needs and that kind of thing are. So one of the things that we really strive to do is we really want to be in that level of job development where the employer calls us and, and they view us as a consultant and they don't, you know, duck, dip and dodge whenever we <laughs> are knocking on their door. They see it as, oh, Tony here, she's going to help us with a solution or Ken is coming to the table. That means you must have a great idea. We really want to be more of that consultant light for them than anything else. And so one of the things that we just try to highlight that we can assist with would be um, having, we can assist with work accommodations, um, connecting to assistive technology. We might not be the experts, but we can definitely make that referral if and when it's necessary. Looking at the job analysis that they have currently and just kind of carving and customizing and just letting them know that this isn't specific or, and this isn't um, just a customized employment endeavor or supported employment endeavor that businesses are are sculpting jobs across the country to make it the most efficient part of the job for the person so we want you doing what you're good at it doesn't make sense to have you know 40 percent of the things that are on your job description not fit you as a person and when we could have you being 100 percent happy in your job and doing it to the best of its ability so job carving obviously is something that we can go in and just help them analyze um, looking at transferable skills, we do a lot of enhanced planning. So if Ken is going to walk to an employer, it's because he's confident in the person that he's bringing in. He's already built a profile on that individual. He knows what they want. He knows what their skills are. If they have questions about performance, he should be able to give you those answers because he's done the work basically behind the scenes with discovery and um, kind of using that team approach to get all of that information. And then obviously benefits planning, we, we think that's wildly important. We have a benefits planner on staff as well as we use some of the, the local opportunities that are presented to us through DEI as well as just voc rehab. Yep, voc rehab. Just to give you a snapshot of some of our progress from 2013 till 2018. So these are the individuals that have been placed. Um, the number of jobs, we have 376 jobs at the moment, earning an average of $8.40 an hour with an average of 17 hours a week. And this is where Rachel typically chimes in and says that that's probably her biggest goal, is upping those hours. I think that's one of the things that we fear as you do see workshops go away, you wonder what are people going to do, it just to not just stay busy, but find value in the life that they have. And really that's us wanting to increase those average hours of work. So just getting them fully integrated and fully included in their job with the maximum number of hours as possible. And at the same time, we recognize, you know, everybody is an individual. So we do have some folks that maybe 10 hours a week is really what they want and what, and what works best for them in their lives with all the other activities that they have going on or just physically able to handle that kind of thing. But yeah, we get excited when folks get, get to move off of benefits. We've had a few of those examples where folks have gotten full-time jobs and been able to completely become independent. Ken wants to interject something there. You know, I work with, with a, a lot of consumers and, and we have um, uh, people working from two hours a week, which is what they can handle, to uh, two people or one person just got off of benefits. Uh, he work, he's working 45 hours 
uh, a week, and, and it's exciting when you get to that point where somebody says, well, I don't, I don't need any assistance from, I don't need food stamps, I, don't, I want to be completely independent, and um, it's one of those things that you uh, have passion for, or it almost brings tears to your eyes to, to see that, you know, so. Those are the good moments, you bet. Um, for customized jobs, we're at 111, and I would credit this, and we'll talk a little bit about, too, some of the training that we've provided within our own agency, and it's really come from a strong partnership with our regions to bring subject matter experts in, like Abby Cooper or Ellen Condon, and have them come in and just really, um, I mean, it's intensive. It's six days of training. We've had two series of six days over the last, Three years. three years. So um, very time intensive, but we feel that our staff walk out and they have the capacity to really perform customized employment to its best ability. Um, we're always obviously seeking new things and looking at webinars and trainings that come about and conferences and such, but we at least give them the base knowledge that they need. Um, this one obviously for us is super exciting. Jobs entered from FBE, which is facility-based employment, is 129. As we're looking to transform all of our work sites, which prior to um, recently, we had a work site in Spirit Lake, Esterville, Spencer, Sibley, and Rock Valley, and now in Worthington, and now we're down to the two sites. So um, making progress, it's not an overnight thing. We've had a strategic plan for a five-year strategic plan that we're four years into, um, and just making sure that we keep moving with the same motivation that we've had from the very beginning. This is really cool too, just knowing that, you know, we've tapped into 23 different communities. So kind of back to those naysayers at the beginning of perception becomes reality and there's not enough businesses or communities. They're there. It's just taken us to be trained in customized employment, having good examples of um, supported employment to get out there and inundate those communities with valued work members as well. Right. And we're excited about the 172 different employers that have hired people too. And, um, yeah, it's just very exciting stuff. Fun. So for the specific strategies that we want to take away or want you guys to take away from this webinar would be through marketing, networking, and it's all about the match. And then we'll add a fourth one here that's not on the slide, which is just Ken's testimonial as a job developer, kind of letting you know what he does on a um, on a typical work day or just helping somebody get a job or how not to give up on the no and just kind of all of that good stuff as well. So to touch on marketing, uh, a lot of this comes from, again, our partnerships with our regions, which we have Northwest Iowa Care Connections and the Sioux Rivers region. And those regions have definitely been strong advocates, and I would say champions when we think about support and employment, community employment, fully being integrated and included. Um, and so we've done some different efforts with them. And, and one of the efforts that we've used that I think that we continue to use is through our marketing campaign um, through Sioux Rivers region, we were able to identify kind of some taglines, some things that we wanted people to associate when they thought of what the, the employment services looked like. And with that, we came up with value, dignity, livelihood. And then our business partners that we use are um, deemed as valued workplaces. And it's something that they can show through a marketing vignette, like a window cling or a table tent. And, and really, it just kind of sparks that conversation. Like, what does it mean to be a valued workplace? Maybe with the customer base or a potential other business partner. And, and then it kind of generates that conversation of, oh, we're working with My Choice Employment or we're working with whatever, whatever provider it was in the region. And kind of and it just really starts that buzz because as we will learn throughout this and what we just learn every day is it's getting out there and talking to people is 100% how we have to make this work. Right. And they also they also did specific things for the employees of those businesses too that were the valued workplaces to really not just have the management be on board but to have the whole team of employees be on board with with the employment first and 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 hiring individuals. Yeah, so what we want to share with you now are some of the, they're really short, they're kind of short and sweet, I think we're going to show you four of them here in a row. Each of them is under two minutes, which that's about what our capacities, <laughs> our brain capacities have. And honestly, what we tried to do with these videos, and you guys can use these to demonstrate what support and employment might look like, but also it can kind of give a foundation if you wanted to create your own video with job candidates that you've supported, kind of just a basis of, short, sweet, to the point. And what's really nice about these videos, I think for myself, is you don't have to go out there and say, trust me, 
Tony, the job developer, it's more of listen to this other employer's experience, listen to how it's benefited them. So we'll go ahead and just play these for you here. Maybe. <laughs> Group works fine. A little bit ago. And if they won't play, we can move on to the we can try the next. Oh wait, it says it's like five seconds in. Oh, oh there we go. He's prompt. You don't have to worry about him coming up with an excuse for not showing up to work. And especially right now, where in our area unemployment is very low, we have trouble filling a lot of positions. Uh, it's wonderful to have somebody that you can rely on to be there to do the job. Uh, he's going to be there with a smile on his face. I did dishes. I spray off the dishes and try to throw a dishwasher. I do so well here. I live in my own apartment. Uh, I pay a lot of bills. Just join in conversations because he likes to interact, listen, comment on what he's saying. He'll help you out when you're in the game. In the process of being helping you, I'm just coaching him up. Tell him, hey, tomorrow we have to still a busy in this area. We have to do this first. And that works for me. He likes getting paid. We all do. It's a wonderful thing. I think it guarantees them a certain level of independence that is valuable to every adult. I think that there's dignity with work and having that place to go every day and knowing that you are valued enough to get a big check when you show up. I think that's important. Yeah. Okay, we'll just roll right into our next video quick here. This is Sarah. And we will say these will be, everything will be available afterwards. Jess will put it on the YouTube channel and you guys can access and watch them again or feel free to use them if you'd like as well. Right, and so I, you can find them in a multiple capacities. What I do for myself is I have them saved I have the YouTube video link saved in my notes on my phone, so it's a quick access for me if I'm talking to somebody and I'm like, hey, do you have two minutes? I'll just give you a little snippet of what it is that we do, and it takes me five seconds to pull up on my phone and I can show them a video. I come to work because it's fun to have me here. I like great people. They contacted me. We talked about placement, coaching, and those kind of things. I said, yeah, we'd love to try that. I think it's gone really well. You know, when I talk to the front-end managers, the people that work right next with her day in, day out, they're always happy to see her. You know, they give her a high five when she comes up front. Always something going on up there in the front end, isn't there? Yeah. Sacking, doing sacks, mm -hmm. taking groceries out. Yes. You do all those very well. Yes. That's important, you know. And the main thing about her and some others that I've worked with in the past years is the, the, the punctuality. You know, she is, if everybody would be like her and show up on time, it would be wonderful. Hi, so like I see when I see her leaving at 520 when she leaves or in that area to catch the bus. I'm like, she's still smiling. It's time for me to kick it up the match for my last hour or two, too. So. It's the right thing to do when you're helping somebody. And that's that's what we're here for. So we'll go to the next two. And what we asked people to do the last time we presented on this was just think about what you like about the video and how it speaks for you and your message versus you having to constantly make that and how it might be more of a viable resource, um, kind of a marketing for you versus, like I said, just being like, believe me, because I said so. So it's kind of a nice little look into a variety of industry and tasks and skills that are being done.
we entered this just looking for a different avenue for a hiring or a recruiting standpoint. And we found two of our more tenured employees through the process. They really to make sure that the job is a good fit. The benefit is, is we're finding employees that are hard workers and um, they want to um, be part of our team. Not only have completed the job duties that we were asking them to at hire, Stephanie has even escalated through what we call our five-star program, which is extra education, and then also completing a five-star project twice a year. Sometimes they ask if we can make another batch, and I'm like, well, let's just do one now, and we'll see how it turned out later, and then we can do another one. So. We have approximately 50 employees here, and not everyone's a five-star uh, five-star person. So um, she's elevated that to within the time frame that she's been here, which is neat to see. I wouldn't have guessed two years ago that it would be this successful. So as you can see there at the end of that video, these are all on the Sioux Rivers website, which is just SiouxRiversPartners.org. So you can go directly to that website, you can look them up on the YouTube, you can type in your YouTube just Sioux Rivers Partners, and there's actually six videos. We just, for the sake of time today, um, really honestly drew straws because they're all really great. So we would advise you to go check them out because each one it could work for you in a different area because they are a variety of industries as well as just kind of a different um, perspective from the employers as well as the job candidate, candidates themselves. Okay, our yep. last one. And it also, the website also has the TV commercial that the, the partners yeah. developed as well. So you can see that if, if that's the direction you feel like you would want to go or just to see what, see what our marketing and the Sioux Rivers partners came up with for that. You betcha. All right, Floyd. I stock the shelves up for people to come over there and to get them if they need them. Oh, I love to be busy because it keeps me on my toes and I don't have to <laughs> be bored. Floyd makes everyone laugh. He makes work fun. Floyd is uh, energetic. He's more energetic than anyone anyone we've ever met. Um, Floyd is a huge part of the culture that we have at Sioux Center here. We had a need, uh, as, as most businesses do in town, where staffing is a huge issue. Um, talk to anybody who has an issue with that. Um, so we had a need for, for people to uh, help us out with, with all sorts of tasks. And so we made a connection with Hope Haven and asked them, uh, do you guys have anybody that would fit this mold? And it worked, uh, and it's worked ever since. I visit with them, I hang out with them just to do stuff with them. So the, the, the immediate benefit is obviously we have uh, someone that can help us as an employee and they can get paid and, and make a living. The bigger reason is it gives us the ability to help other people better their lives. I just, I just like to pay my own bills have a good and have a, a nice life and to be with my friends more. Okay, so that's it for the videos, but as you can see, we we really enjoy those. We think that for the less than two minute moment, it does a really good job of capturing what it is that we're trying to do. And we try to utilize those whenever we're going out there. They're a great thing when you're working with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, um, whether you run into an HR person at a friend's going away party, which I did. And then I pulled him to the side and I said, you gotta check this out. Cause he wasn't really, you know, we sometimes we get lost in our own little social service world and we just assume that everybody knows what job development and customized employment and job coaching and and things like that are and it's 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 really the opposite of that so just kind of having a an opportunity to let somebody else do some of the talking is really great and so our goal once you have your marketing tools whatever you decide those be whether those be short videos or swag with your your name on it or whatever it is once you have the marketing tools um, in your hands is when you're going to start networking and 
what we really wanted to allude to here and something I don't think we're afraid of saying is that we have not done this alone. And if we would have tried doing this alone, we would not have been successful or trying um, to get to the point where we feel successful in the placements and kind of our transformation from a facility, having facility-based employment to just community-based employment. Um, these are just a list of the partners that we've had within our opportunities to be part of the transformation. So when you're networking, um, we really tap into all sorts of stuff. So this is just networking on behalf of what Hope Haven is and what My Choice Employment is, but as well as looking at jobs. So just to go over some of these, we we use the network of the job candidate themselves as well as their family. And we'll, we'll share some stories, Ken can too, as well as who he's used in the past to kind of warm up a contact, if you will, out of a business of interest for a job candidate. We have a strong partnership with IVRS, um, the MCOs through the IME process, and our regions. Um, we really talk about our regions a lot, but it's because they have a pretty heavy hand in a lot of the things that we do. They've supported us in bringing the APSI job coaching training and job development training series to um, more of a local venue on two different occasions. They have supported us, like I said before, with customized employment training coming in, um, just some different things. And it's really nice to know that many hands makes light work and that it is much bigger than just my choice employment. So if you're out there trying to do this on your own, that's where you got to switch it up and not be afraid to kind of tap into the other services that are out there and just partner, partner, partner. And I think one thing of working with the regions that has helped us or just been, been beneficial too is the relationship that has helped build with other providers in our areas too. So we're, we're sharing ideas and, and getting together the Northwest Iowa Job Developers Coalition. Yeah. We're wanting to kind of set up something similar in our other region too so we can all kind of brainstorm and, and work off of each other too. Like we said before, those kind of informal lunch get together and brag and steal what's working, what's not working, what's the coolest customized employment job you've ever done, and just kind of thinking about pieces of that and just kind of um, taking those back and putting them in your everyday work. So when you're out there and you're networking, this is just a cool, it takes two minutes. It's an app that I have on my phone that I use all the time and it really helps. This is basically just to help you stay organized when you're out there because you really should be out pounding the pavement, meeting business, um, people in businesses, they're gonna hand you a business card. We want you to be able to um, not lose that information and then share that information. Like I said before earlier, we have around 11 professional level employment specialists, transition specialists, whatnot, and we can share it quick. So it's just like a two minute video of how the app works. It's, it's called Cam Card. Making lots of new connections is good. Keeping track of all those business cards? That's the tough part. Until now. Welcome to the all new Cam Card. With Cam Card, you can quickly store anybody's contact information. All you need is a phone and their business card. Just snap a photo of the card, and in seconds, the Cam Card app scans it and saves the info, both to your phone's contact list and to your Cam Card account. For every card it scans, Cam Card auto detects its orientation, smart crops the edges, and enhances the way it looks. The result? A clear, beautiful image. It's easy to search, sort, group, and merge cards, or share them with colleagues. And any edit made on one device updates all of them. But CamCard doesn't just keep you organized. It also helps grow your business. With the brand new AR card feature, you aren't stuck being represented by a basic business card. Instead, you can create an interactive virtual world connected to your contact information. Add graphics, videos, links, 3D models of products, and more. Personalizing your AR card helps you and your company stand out from the crowd. And no matter the language you use, once you create an AR card, it will be 100% accurately read by your partners all over the world. Anytime you add to your AR card, everyone you're linked with will see a special recently updated icon next to your name in their contact list. Staying organized and growing your business has never been easier. Cam Card. Read your card. Mind your business. So that just gives a snapshot of what it does. It's really simple to use. It's a free app, not getting any kick kickbacks from Cam Card. <laughs> <laughs> I just really like it because it takes out some of the, for me, just making sure that I'm staying organized and have that information and then I can share that with um, other coworkers. 
And one, one thing as we're growing and having more and more uh, job developers and kind of covering same areas in some of our programs, we're developing a Google app, Google Drive thing where we can keep track of everybody just has a quick little app that they can use on their phone, which we're just getting started using. So they can plug in if they, the contact of the employer, that contact information, was it, how did the meeting go? You know, is it a, is it a warm contact? Is it, they were like a no, or they're excited about maybe working with us, that kind of thing. So we can all access that information. So our job developers aren't going and talking to the same employers over and over again and confusing them and to try to have that consistency of message as we're going out there. Right. Yep, exactly. And just making sure that, that um, you know who the decision maker is so that is identified within that Google sheet as well. So it's just kind of a nice information. And then if Rachel's gonna go check out Casey's and she sees that Ken warmed it up, she can call him and just get kind of the skinny on on who, who to talk to and who to go straight to. So just making sure you're as efficient as possible. So yesterday I talked to my team at our monthly My Choice meeting and I said, tell me your secrets. I have to do a webinar tomorrow and I have to <laughs> figure out the strategies that you guys have. And, and honestly, they all shared something and it really just boils down to it's who you know and it, it's tapping outside of your own as well. So it's your personal network, your job candidates network. And we had an example of um, a student that is a student job candidate and tapped into the school's affiliation. It was a teacher's friend that owns the boutique and now they're getting into a, a, a boutique and it's just really interesting once you kind of get outside of that feeling of having to do this on your own and how am I supposed to know every business in the area and just kind of realizing that you don't have to know them but you probably know somebody who does. So even just within your own agency, like your coworkers network, when you think about the people that sit in the offices next to you, they have spouses or parents or children that work somewhere outside of the agency. And just kind of what do you know about the businesses in which they work and do they have any employment needs? And you know, would it be worth checking into those? And just as well as your agency affiliations, you know, where does your agency bank at? Where does your agency get their supplies? Does your agency use a different company for cleaning or their um, printing supplies or like the actual printers themselves? And just so many businesses that you don't really think about that your agency has a partnership or working partnership with already um, just to make sure that you're tapping into those as well. And one of the other things was don't give up. <laughs> Even if you get a no, you know, keep going back. You've got to walk that that line between being persistent and being a stalker, we said, but, <laughs> but you know, management changes or, or philosophies change, that kind of thing, their, their needs change. So we want to, them to, again, see us as a resource and, and know, know who we are when right. we're coming in the door, so. All right, so now we're gonna pop it over to Ken and he's gonna talk to you guys for five, seven minutes here about just kind of his process and his take on what he does for job development um, Ken has a large caseload. He lives in a, or he works in an area that has a lot of seasonal employment, um, and can just kind of talk a little bit about what it is that he does. Tell you, Ken. All right, thank you. Uh, first of all, there's a lot of things that were were said today about uh, referrals and, and and just networking. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, you know we have the traditional things of of you know looking at Indeed.com. Uh, snag a job, looking through the paper, business after five, um, your sub organizations, uh, Kiwanis, get out there and speak, speak to them. Um, we live in rural America and what it's about is planting seeds. Uh, some of them germinate, some of them don't. Um, but uh, like Rachel alluded, alluded to about uh, don't give up. Uh, I have a sales background, I've been in, was uh, in the field for 10 years early, went into sales for 20 some years. And one of the things they say is uh, it takes seven times to close a sale. Now, we're not selling a product, we're selling a service. And uh, you know what we're looking at is, is selling uh, uh, possible solutions for business. And um, I think that's one of the things that we, uh, you know we have to do out there is is being active um, we're building a network of employment opportunities for uh, current job seekers and future job seekers so I think those are the things that uh, that we have to look at we all have passion 
for what we do or else we wouldn't be doing it. Um, and uh, one of the things that uh, uh, I look at is um, I like doing a lot of cold calling because I think um, in rural America, it is a small town network. Um, and um, so be active. Um, you're always out there selling the services. Uh, talk to as many people as possible and be, um, and be ready um, and definitely have a 30 second commercial. I personally do not like a canned com commercial um, because you, we're in customized employment. So I don't, you know, everything is custom. We have to adjust to the, to the employer. Um, we might come in there with a job seeker and have a, a certain set of circumstances that uh, that work for that particular business, uh, but you have to be ready for some of the objections that com could come up. And I think that you know um, one of the ways of doing that is is actually take the stories that you have, you know, the things that you're most familiar with. You, I know every one of you has four or five stories that you've either personally experienced or heard that you can use. Um, so what I like to do is paint a picture for somebody uh, when you go in and either do a cold call or a second call um, and uh, paint a picture of what you know type of solutions that we can offer um, for a particular uh, company. For example, one of the things in a manufacturing uh, facility, you know, we have a, a, a person and that's making $25 an hour running a CNC, but 20% of their job is unwrapping parts, okay? So is this episodic duties? Uh, you know, it could be done at a certain time, um, or it could be done at different times. So do your homework on what the company is and what they're doing and, and uh, ask around. I think that, that uh, you know, we need to uh, uh, use the examples we have and have experience because those are the ones that we're most comfortable with. Those are the ones that are easy to talk about. I think, um, you know, not only do, you know, we bring a, a consumer and a job seeker to the table where um, they're having their skills and abilities that you're, you're showcasing, but we also have to practice our skills and abilities. And the way to do that is get out there and do it. I think that, um, Cold calling is one of the most difficult things that people are afraid of because they're afraid to, you know, to do it, walk in the door, give a speech. You have to ask. If you don't ask for, you know, uh, a job or if you don't ask for, uh, you know, what you're doing, you never have that opportunity to, to get a job for somebody. I think that um, the, uh, you know, one of the things you have to first ask when you're doing a cold call is who does the hiring? Um, and at that point, then you get, you know, you get to that, uh, you know, that next level and be ready for all the objections that, that come up and have fun. I think that that's, that's the key is, um, we all know it works. It works for the, the employer. It works for the person and we have fun doing it. So, um, I'm, you know, I'm not, um, um, I'm not sure that, uh, uh, we all kind of take a look at at um, everything that we bring to the table and everything that uh, um, you know everyone and what we can do and make it work for for a company. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, and I'm surprised you didn't mention this because this is one of my favorite things that you do talk about, is really getting to understand the employer's pain trail. And I feel like you should quote that. And I do give you credit when I do speak about that in public. I say, one of my employment specialists, Ken, always talks about getting to understand the employer's pain trail because it's not all glory, you know, and, and that's what we have to, that's what we ask for too. So, you know, on here we have listed kind of the different levels of, or the different parts of the process with job development. And what you want to make sure is that you have a relationship with that employer so that if you're asking for a job site survey or an employer survey, you're not getting like the token tour, the tour where they show you every, all of their glory. You really want to let them know that we want to come in and see if there's 
anything, you know, just speak really candidly. Like, is there anything that's a pain in the butt? Like, what is not getting done at the end of the day? What do managers complain the most about? What would make your life easier? Because there is something out there. I mean, I can think of personally a stack of things that I have, and, and it's not synonymous to me. It's it, with that in every business, every company, there's something that's not getting done either the right way, the most efficient, and it's just making that employer know that you're really there to see if you have a possible solution for them and never really over promising something that you don't have. It, and it's okay. I think we've probably developed before where we've walked in and we've found a need, but maybe we didn't have a match. And the employer is going to appreciate that much more than trying to fit like a round peg into a square hole or vice versa. Like you have to make sure that you're going to be able to make that match. But it's just getting that relationship built where there's that trust and it's not the glory tour and you actually want to get down to knowing kind of the problems that do exist. And like Ken said before, if there's a solution that you can possibly bring to the table with your team. And I think that's the important thing to think about too for confidence when you're going in and talking because we all get a little nervous maybe having to go in and speak with people we haven't sure. spoke with before but we have good stuff to offer them we have solutions to offer them right. and just to keep that in mind that we're not there to annoy them or take mm -hmm. away their time we're there to help them solve a problem and I think that you need to let you know let the business talk about and usually listen listen to what they have to say because you know that pain trail I did mention that a number of times before yeah. but I'm kind of surprised you brought that up but <laughs> you listen to me I do I uh, do um, that yeah that pain trail because there is there's one thing at least that a, that an employer uh, has that they want to get rid of or solve yeah you know and uh, it's possible once you hit that then you then you could work it Yep, and, and like Ken just said, the you really want them to do a lot of the talking. So what we would tell you to do is a minimum of 80-20 in terms of when you're talking to an employer, you really want to be listening 80% of the time and having them really direct and steer the conversation. You can have some pointed questions that you know that you're there for and that you want to get answered, maybe five or eight while you're talking to them but just really letting them kind of go in the direction and, and that's where those needs will arise especially if that level of comfortability and don't think it's going to be there it's not going to be there on a cold call it's not going to probably be there on that initial contact or even that second one it might take some just conversations of you know like talking about current workplace trends and um, what you've recently done to help a, a like a sister business or a business that is in a similar industry or just kind of sharing those experiences with them and not really pushing things on them but just having them be privy to the information that you have um, just getting out there talking about it so one of the things too that we just allude to in here is just making sure that as job developers so as you're out there developing jobs you kind of see what the system needs and how it needs to be maybe different whether that's working directly with a MCO or a different funder or VR and just making sure that you're having a voice for yourself in terms of advocating for change all too often I think we view like systems, we blame it on the system, and a system is this giant machine that's indestructible. The system is made up of people. So if you can get together and advocate for change and just making sure that you're a part of the right group. And so we've just kind of listed out, you know, who we have um, a partnership with, which is IACP, I, Iowa Coalition for Integrated Employment. Thanks, Jess and Amy. Um, just being part of an employment for a state in general, like I said, having a participation in APSI. And that doesn't mean you have to be on the board, you absolutely can, but just making sure that you're kind of tuned in to the information that they send out. Um, we were part of the Iowa Medicaid redesign, which really allowed for us to kind of have a voice in kind of the restructuring of the funding mechanisms within the state. And then just some things that you can do, like I said before, just make sure you're engaging stakeholders, um, networking with other providers and state agencies. So. I never know enough. I love consulting with other agencies to see what's working, what's not working, how they're structuring their program. Um, just anything that you're really frazzled with, pick up the phone. There's somebody that can either vent with you <laughs> or help you through that situation and just um, kind of have you guys come forward with a game plan. And it, obviously, if it's something that you're going through, somebody else might be as well. So these are basic, if you're out there job developing, you know these, the critical goals for support and employment. Um, one of the things that I'd really like to see, and I think Griffin and Hammis has 
uh, illustration out there. I should have thrown it in here, but they do a really good job. It has a bunch of circles, and, and there's the difference between segregation, integration, and inclusion. And really, uh, integration three years ago was the buzzword, and I think the buzzword now just has to be inclusion. So it's not enough to get somebody integrated in the community into a community job. We want to make sure that they are included in all of the aspects of the work, life, culture, and environment that they're in. So again, like we said before, it has to be a match. We can talk to a, an employer all day, and if we think we have something great, and if not, that within our current caseload, it's not going to work. Um, we figure out those matches through discoveries with the job candidate, the employer. We use a positive personal profile to get to know somebody. Um, we use a team approach to get to know someone. We partner with VR. What do they already know? We're really, yeah, career exploration, um, just a bunch of different opportunities to kind of build that career profile for someone so that our job developer is equipped to get out there. Then we want to make sure the job candidate is prepared. We found this funny, but Rachel and I have a different <laughs> sense of humor than most. But me, how's it is we assume that dinosaurs just roared? They could have talked like us, right? And then the interviewer says, I meant questions about the job. So just making sure that your job candidate is prepared for those things, and that just comes through practice. We do a lot of mock interviews, making sure that they are dressed appropriately for the job at hand. Um, and I believe that if you have true centered planning, it will allude to what the supports will be needed for that job candidate in the employment process, the search process, as well as once they're on the job. So you're gonna know what that person needs as far as how to prep them for that job. So these are things that we just thought would be important for you guys to have on here since the PowerPoint will be shared with you. We use these kind of on a one page handout for employers just to let them know what customized employment is, what are the specific work site issues that it targets. Um, and we list them up here so that they can see them and then maybe they can start thinking to themselves, do I have any areas where something like this is occurring? And then they can start thinking about how customized employment might benefit them. And then, like Ken said, too, being able to have specific examples, even in, in a, as a manufacturing type of business or a, a retail store, or that kind of thing. If you have an example of something that's worked somewhere else, those are great testimonials. And then the other thing that I've used in the past is, you know, when somebody's been a little bit hesitant, um, you know, and I've, I've talked to other my employers that I've had, you know, really good success with is being able to use them. Um, as as a reference, say you know you know you're welcome to call um, you know this employer, this employer, and this employer just to you know uh, to show credibility you know that, that that this works and I and all of a sudden they're like they can't really respond to something like that because you have proof you have actual proof that this works and can help their business. Yeah, this next slide just breaks down. This is part of the last slide. We pair that slide and this next one with information on our one page takeaway, just the benefits to employers and the job candidates or the employees with customized employment. Um, we think this is what matters most, and that's just building trust with the job seeker and their family, as well as the employers that you're out there networking with, just really getting out there and letting people know who you are and what it is that you're striving for. Um, we won't have time for this. So this is an activity that we do. We call it dream funneling. And it's really just starting with that person. Sometimes you have a person walk in and it seems pretty darn dreamy, but really break that dream apart. So if somebody walks in and says they want to be a NASCAR driver, you want to start asking questions just to understand it. So you might not be able to help them be a NASCAR driver, and maybe you can. But if you can't, you can at least start pulling out. Is it the fact that they like driving? Is it that they like being around cars? Is it they like the fame? Is What is it? And just start thinking of questions that you have around that. So hopefully today throughout this webinar, you had some takeaways, and that's just the use of marketing, networking, and matching. Um, and we are going to leave you with our last video. It's a little bit longer than the other ones. It's a little over three minutes here, and then we should have time for questions. But we'll let you guys go ahead and take a look at this. Even when I was a small child, I never liked the way I felt. I never did. Honestly, it might have, it might have been watching my father with his mental illness. Watching him and not knowing what was wrong with him, but seeing all the symptoms and seeing all of that as a young child, all those years, I always felt I always felt alone, even though there was people all around me. I always felt lonely. Um, I was looking for that 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 hole in me to fill, 
and I thought drugs could fill that hole. And my mental illness first came about when I was about 12 years old. And as soon as I turned 18 and I started abusing meth, eventually it got to the point where I couldn't live without it. I ended up getting expelled um, for becoming violent with another student. The drugs became very heavy after I dropped out of high school. I've overdosed, ended up in hospitals. I've been in and out of institutions and psych ward so many times I can't even tell you. They gave me a number, it's probably six or seven different places that were gonna accept me. And I heard about Spirit Lake and Okapochi, so I heard it was a beautiful area and I love to go fishing. They said, there's lakes up here. And so I came here and ever since I've been here, things have just slowly gotten better. He wanted something better. He really said he wanted to be in a manufacturing. You know, we came out to Rosenboobs, did a tour of the place, and um, he really liked it and said he wanted to try this. I worked side by side with him, making sure that Mike felt comfortable in the environment. And over time, uh, Mike just became stronger and stronger. Uh, our supports became less and less. My job experience here has been probably the best one I've ever had because not only do I get to pay the bills because I have a job, but I'm looking towards retirement. I mean, I have good benefits. The labor force around here um, is, a, is a good labor force, but it's just tapped out. There's really not as much availability of workers. Uh, several of the candidates that we've worked with through Hope Haven are just so appreciative to have an opportunity and to be here. They're very positive and uplifting. He's one of those people that always seems motivated, always wants to work hard, always wants to do a good job, and he doesn't always need the recognition. The only thing he wants to do is make himself better. I was on Social Security Disability, and um, I'm grateful for that because it kept, kept me afloat while I needed the money. But I knew there was a better life, and I didn't want to rely on the government for a check. He was very adamant from the very beginning that he wanted to be off benefits, he wanted to be gainfully employed, and he wanted to be completely independent. Yeah, he's a stand-up guy with a lot to give. It definitely builds character to recover from an addiction. It makes you grateful for what you have every day because you, most of us lost everything. It's definitely very rewarding as well to know that we're not just giving somebody a paycheck, but we're giving them that opportunity to get their feet back on the ground and uh, to make another life for themselves. I'm a firm believer that a job will pay, change a person's life forever. It puts tears in my eyes, really, to see what he's done. I was so, so deep into the addiction and my mental illness that they, were, they thought I couldn't climb out of it. But uh, God put his hand down and pulled me out of that hole. This life is just so much better, and I wouldn't give it up for anything. Okay, awesome. Thank you guys very much. We believe the most effective way to do it is to do it. Do you have any questions for us? I know we were running you about to the minute here. And then, yeah, if you do have questions, you can sure shoot them to us um, via our emails, which are posted here for you. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Jess. Thank you, guys. Fan yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Tony and Rachel and Ken. Um, oh, we'll wait here to see if anybody's got any uh, questions, comments. Um, oh, let's see. Okay, so there's a question coming in, just a general one around uh, problem solving or getting transportation uh, for job candidates. Well, we have like virtually no public transportation, at least like in my western side. We do have very limited hours in a few of our communities, but none in between communities. At the lakes, they have a, a few. We just really, really look for natural supports. We look for coworkers. We've, we've looked at people's own networks with churches, that kind of thing. Um, transportation is one of the biggest challenges that we face. In, in you know in developing a job because you have to take a look at that in in the full picture and you're right we have looked at natural supports as being uh, being one uh, public transportation we do have taxis and cabs um, it's an in expense some of our areas. In some of us, yeah. yeah we don't have that here so yeah so yeah. anyway it's it, it is a challenge um, we don't have that golden answer Jess no. <laughs> but I will <laughs> right. Say, you know, try not to let that stand in the way because it yeah. seems like if it's a if it's if we've had this 
if it's a good fit, you'll figure out a way to make it work. Oh. You'll, coworkers will stand. I was going to say, go back to family. that network. Yep. Yep. Go back to that network. And who do they have? And who do they associate with? How do people get there typically anyways? Can they chip in for a carpool? Even if they're never going to drive, they would always be chipping in for the carpool. And just, you really do. It forces you to get creative. Good luck to everyone with that. <laughs> and if anybody has other ideas, yeah, share we're all them. ears as well. Yeah, those are great ideas. And I think sometimes folks uh, forget too about their smaller regional transit authorities. And those something, like you said, there might not be something current that's happening with a particular line or mode of transportation, but um, I know they like to hear from us about what we're seeing and what's happening and kind of what the needs are so that they can try to address that um, at the regional level with the regional transit agencies. Um, and if you're not sure who that is, you just send me an email and I've got a, I've got a great map for you that uh, lays out all the regional transit areas across the state, those agencies and their contacts. So, Great. Yes. Well, I don't see any other questions coming in, uh, but I'll keep it open here in case they do. Um, again, I'll remind folks that we'll send out the presentation along with the um, link to the recording, uh, as well as how to get to those uh, marketing or success story videos if you're interested in, in using those um, or adapting something similar for yourself. We will be back in August, uh, August 14th, actually, second Tuesday of the month, and, and really excited to welcome uh, Catherine Carroll. Uh, she's going to talk to us about discovering the genius of the family. Uh, some of you re may remember that Catherine was here at our last APS Iowa AFSI conference um, and just had a wonderful presentation. So we're really excited to have her um, kind of talk to us about engaging the family um, in the process of employment and kind of a full life and, and some great strategies and ideas around that. Uh, so we hope to see you August 14th at 1 p.m. Um, and I think. Uh, Without further ado, we'll just uh, say goodbye for today and see you in August. Uh, and let me know if you need a certificate of attendance. Thanks, everybody. Thanks again, Tony, Rachel, Ken. You guys have a good rest of the day. Thank you so much. Thank you.